Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that will spend his spring break searching for Bigfoot with Jose Canseco. He is the captain. Jose, can you see that Sasquatch? It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very proud to be featuring Escape to Colorado IPA by the adventure-seeking brewers over at Epic Brewing in, well, they have breweries in Denver, Colorado, and Salt Lake City, Utah, so as Baker Mayfield would say, you're going to have to pick your poison. Garage grade, three and three-quarter bottle caps out of five. This year, Escape to Colorado IPA gets a new look and a new recipe. And Epic Brewing recently rolled out a broader distribution so more of us can experience their great beers. And this week's great beer was brought to us by this Epic crew right here. First up, we have Kelly in Evansville, Indiana. And a big we like your jib to Amanda in Little Rock, Arkansas. Next up, a cheers to Sarah in Trey, Pennsylvania. And love from the sea bus, we have Brittany W. in Columbus, Ohio. And a big shout out to Jen W. and Maddie Ice in Parts Unknown. And last but not least, we have Alec and Spanish for Alabama. So thanks to everybody for helping us out with this week's beer fund. If you want to help us out for next week's shows, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. If you'd like to see our ugly mugs, follow us on Instagram at True Crime Garage and check out our website, truecrimegarage.com, because we just restocked some stuff and got some new stuff for the store. And that is enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime says she talked to her daughter the day she disappeared and Kaylin seemed fine. But police tell a different story. They say she acted very unusual leading up to her disappearance. She called 911 three times reporting a fight and a burglary that officers say didn't happen. And two surveillance videos show Louder having animated conversations with herself. Police found no evidence of foul play. January 21st, 1984, twins are born in American Fork, Utah. The twins' names, Kaylin and Colton Louder. The proud parents are Jesse and Suzanne Louder. Little Kaylin was a funny kid. She loved her siblings and enjoyed teasing them. She loved her friends and she was a friend to all. Kaylin enjoyed reading, sharing books, and riding horses. And here's something that I absolutely love, Captain. Kaylin was so competitive, very competitive. In fact, she was so fiercely competitive playing Scrabble that no one liked to play Scrabble with her. Kaylin attended and graduated from Lehigh High School. She enrolled at Utah State University and graduated in 2006, earning a bachelor's degree in social work. She lived her life devoted to helping others, so it makes so much sense that she wanted to become a social worker. And at age 25, she's going to have a major event happen in her life. Yeah, and this involves Kaylin's twin brother, Colton, who is 25 as well, obviously. This takes place on February 27th, 2009 in American Fork, Utah. Colton is at his uncle's house. This is Colton's mother's brother, 45-year-old Jeffrey Ackerman. This is a Friday, and Jeffrey Ackerman is in his driveway loading some four-wheelers. This is because he's planning to go for a ride for the weekend. Now, around 12.45 in the afternoon, witnesses say they heard two men arguing. Well, the shouting turned into a gunshot. 
One homeowner looked out his window and saw Jeffrey Ackerman chasing a man through his yard and then across the street and into a field. The man being chased turned around and shot Ackerman three to four times in the stomach and chest. Police were called. This is just your average American neighborhood. You know, basketball hoops and white picket fences, and we have a man down, shot multiple times, police on the way, with scared neighbors and a gunman on the loose. As this whole thing is unfolding, the police assessing what happened, tending to the victim, trying to get him medical attention, and searching for the shooter, three schools in the area were put under lockdown for a couple of hours. And police asked all three schools not to transport students with buses. Students who usually walked called their parents. Then around 2 p.m., someone at a nearby medical clinic saw the suspect standing near a car. The witness alerted the police. The man was cornered by police, and the suspect raised his hands in the air and shouted, I didn't do it. The man did not try to run from what the police say. And the police found a gun, a 45 automatic, on the hood of a car parked at the clinic. They arrested the suspect. The shooter turned out to be Colton Louder. Jeffrey Ackerman was pronounced dead at the hospital. Police shut down the area for hours to gather evidence and interview witnesses. Then they charged Colton with murder. There was some confusion in this case. It was... It wasn't such a cut-and-dried case. Well, on the surface, it seems pretty easy. You have the victim. He is now dead. And then you have the suspected shooter mm -hmm. with a gun in custody, and you're charging him with murder while you arrest him. Yeah. So you have the victim. You find the shooter. This all happens within just a couple of hours. But truly, no one really knew what went down except for the shooter and the victim. And here we have a scenario where eyewitness reports are that the shooter was at one time being chased by the gunshot victim. There were stories out there at the time that Colton was a known drug user and was in the area breaking into and stealing stuff from garages, or that he was caught by his uncle stealing stuff out of his garage. Another theory presented was Colton was over at his uncle's because Uncle Jeffrey was trying to help Colton get off of drugs and somehow an argument between the two broke out. So picture this for a bit, shall we? Mm -hmm. We have a family where one family member is the victim and the other is the likely killer. So you are both grieving and shocked and each on two different levels. One of the officers involved said he was on the scene and a vehicle pulled up to him and behind the wheel driving is a lady that he recognized. And she tells the officer, I hear the victim was my brother. What's going on? Right. And to which he has to tell her, yes, ma'am, I know. And we have apprehended the suspect and it's your son. Yeah. Well, through some very good, and I want to really applaud the legal teams here, both sides the prosecution and the defense for really doing their due diligence here because the truth about what went down that day was really none of what we just mentioned. Through toxicology tests, they were able to determine that both Colton, the shooter, and the deceased victim were high on drugs. Right. This during the time of the shooting. Right. So we have a situation where we thought that his uncle was trying to help him get clean, but in reality they were doing drugs together. Yes, and in, in fact, the deceased Jeffrey Ackerman was on a buffet of drugs, according to the toxicology test. Mm, well, normally when I like to do drugs, I like to do a buffet as well. So both did a considerable amount of methamphetamines just before the shooting. So what we have here is people on the inner circles of each of these men that tell investigators that when Colton Louder does drugs, he gets very paranoid. Right. And then others say when Jeffrey Ackerman does drugs, he gets very angry. So now you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to deduce how this cookie crumbled because both are lit up like Christmas trees. And then an argument slash fight breaks out and the paranoid guy shoots the very angry, scary guy. Well, and I'm glad you're not Sherlock Holmes because that'd make me Watson. 
Well, and because of these circumstances and some other circumstances, the prosecution and defense are going to work out a deal. And on November 17th, 2009, Kalen's twin brother pleads guilty to manslaughter charges and is sentenced to five years in prison for the killing of their uncle, Jeffrey Ackerman. Yeah, technically he gets five years to life in prison. Yeah. Well, and you know what, Captain? I want to point out how smart and caring this family is, the Louder family. I thought you were going to say me. (laughs) Before we move on. Okay. So this is a terrible, horrible tragedy, but the Louder family was strong enough that they could both mourn the loss of one of their own and still support and care for one of their own. You know, they didn't take sides during this. They simply had to say, look, this is something that we all hate, but it happened. And it so obviously would not have happened without drugs ruining both of these men's lives. And now we have to support a family member as much as we can, who is now behind prison walls. Yeah. And cause look, the family members don't want their family members to be drug addicts. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you're going down to the golden corral and you're filling up on, on drugs and then you go, then this happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you go, you're, you're technically losing both family members. One is now deceased, but one you're losing to the prison system. Yeah. And in our story today, our case today is not so much about Colton Louder. It's much more about his twin sister, Kaylin Louder. So let's fast forward to 2014 because at some point later in the year, this would have been late August or early September of 2014. Right. Kaylin lost her job. She was working at a private boys school. This seems to be as a result of maybe a schedule conflict because it appears that she was working two jobs. Kaylin was working for Rover.com, which is a house sitting, dog sitting, dog walking, um, you know, online business. Right. And my guess here is that there may have been a scheduling conflict, meaning they might have been able to prove that we might have a situation where she called off work one day at the boys school and they found out she was actually dog sitting or working for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So other than that, I don't really know the full particulars of, of her losing her job. But in late September, this is when things get strange. So Kaylin calls nine one one twice on September 26th. Then we'll go through these in detail in just a minute. Right. The next day, Saturday, September 27th, 2014, Kaylin calls 911 again. She is last seen on surveillance video leaving her condo. And this footage is from Saturday, September 27th, and around 7 p.m. After the third 911 call. Correct. Kaylin Louder is reported missing on Wednesday, October 1st, 2014. Now, this is according to the Daily Mail. Police were first alerted to Miss Louder's disappearance on Wednesday after her roommate realized she had not seen or heard from her for a while. According to an interview with Kaylin's mother, sister, and cousin, on that Monday, right? So Kaylin is last seen on Saturday. Right. On that Monday, just two days after, Kaylin's mother tells Kaylin's father how weird it is that she has not heard from Kaylin. All right, so on the Friday, we got two 911 calls. Saturday, one call, and then she's seen on camera leaving her condo. Nobody hears from her. This is now the Monday. Yes, and so I guess they checked in fairly regular, almost daily. Mm -hmm. So after her mother tells her father, hey, I've not heard from her, he tries to get a hold of her, but without any luck. Then Kaylin's roommate calls Suzanne, Kaylin's mother, on that Tuesday and asks her, have you seen Kaylin? I haven't seen her for a couple of days. That is when the family begins to panic. The next morning, her father goes to her condo and he does not find Kaylin, but he finds her phone, purse, and dog. Which is interesting. I mean, who cares really much about the purse? I mean, that probably has her ID in it, and that's interesting, but her dog. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to take care of your dog. Yeah, and one thing I want to point out real quick, too, is regarding Kaylin's car keys. Mm -hmm. So most of the articles out there regarding this case state that 
she left behind her phone, keys, purse, and the dog. And I want to try to, this isn't really going to clear anything up, but going to directly to the source, let's say, mm-hmm. I did find an interview with the parents where they state that her car keys were gone. So I know that kind of just makes things confusing. I'm going to go with what they say because right. they have more a more vested interest in finding her than anyone else. So let's go with, if they say the car keys were gone, they were gone. Well, and the car keys probably has her condo keys on it. And this is a pretty nice condo unit, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so the other thing too, Captain, is Kaylin's immediate family, they were very involved in the search for their daughter and their sister. The missing flyers distributed... uh, they they distributed them. They they put things online asking anyone for help and seeking information. Uh, the the flyers list Kaylin Louder as missing from Murray, Utah, since September twenty seventh, two thousand and fourteen. Aged thirty at the time, five foot eight inches tall, right, and weighing about one hundred and thirty pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. Her condo was at the Willows Condominiums. And she was in condo F at 5500 Willow Lane. Now let's circle back real quick and go through some of this stuff in detail, starting with the 911 calls. The first call is to report a fight. This is on Friday night, right? The first call, Kaylin makes this call from her cell phone around 9 p.m. And she's reporting that there's a large fight at her condo's clubhouse. There was an event there that night. So this is not completely out of left field. There was a wedding reception there that night. Mm -hmm. In Kaylin's call, she states that she heard gunshots or that she believes there were guns involved. Now, I state this because we don't have that actual call to listen to. I couldn't find that call to actually listen to. I can only reference what was reported later. Now, The problem here is police do respond. They arrive responding to this call, and when they arrived, they did find that the party was actually a wedding reception, and the police say there appeared to be no evidence of any type of violence or guns at this party. Then the second 911 call that came that same night, again, this is the day before she was last seen. Right. This time, she calls an hour after the first call. So but 1030. She, yeah, so she hangs up before 911 actually picks up the call. Mm-hmm. The dispatcher decides to call her back. Now, according to reports, they state that on the tape, she sounds confused and has trouble remembering her address. She is mumbling and difficult to understand. At one point, she tells the dispatcher her roommate thinks she is confused. Quote, my friend told me I'm delusional and paranoid she tells the dispatcher she also told the operator that this is a little strange because we don't have the full conversation to reference what she might mean by some of this stuff but she also told the operator that she lived in a don't tell don't meddle type of community and she didn't want to endanger her friends so that's the events that we know of of that friday and those are the two nine one one calls and now we're to Saturday, and we have the third 911 call, but we actually have a copy of that. Yeah, and the audio, i got to warn everyone, the audio is a little bit tricky here for a couple of reasons. One, at the beginning, it's a lot of back and forth between the dispatcher and Kalen. He's trying to figure out her location. So they've naturally bleeped those things out, that information out, before they release this, as well as I don't believe that the reception was super great at her condo. 911, what's the address of your emergency? I find 84107, I'm in the street or house. Repeat the address for verification. They're stealing shit from my house. Okay, say your address one more time. I'm having a hard time hearing you. <laughs> Murray. And the phone number you're calling from? 801. Get the out of my house. And repeat the phone number for verification. Eight. Okay, do you know who this person is? No, I don't. I just know that there's an intruder in my house. You don't know who they are? No, I don't. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to look where, from where I'm at because I'm worried about my safety. Be 
Please hurry. Are you at the location now? Yes, I am. Were weapons involved or mentioned? They're not talking or responding. I'm just telling them to leave so I can hear them taking things. So you haven't seen them, you can just hear them? Yes, correct. Are you or anyone else in immediate danger? I believe so. <laughs> okay, are you able to get yourself to safety? Um, I just want to answer that while he's here. I'm sorry, what? No. Can you talk freely with me? Yeah. Okay, where exactly are you? I'm in the back bedroom. Okay. <sighs> oh. Where did the suspect door? enter the building? Um, there's only one door it's on the west side. Okay, where are the possible exits from the building? There's only one. Get out of my is there, house! Is there anyone else in the building who belongs there? Yes, there's six apartments. I'm sorry, what? Six. There's six people? Six apartments. Okay, is there anybody else in your apartment that should be there? I believe she is here. I have a roommate. Where is she at? Next door to me. Okay, I'm just going to stay on the line with you until officers get there, okay? Just let me know if anything changes. What is your last name? Louder. And your first name? Kaylen. It's what? Kaylen. Can you still hear them? Yes. Where does it sound like they're at? The front room, near the entrance. It's a small place. Shut up! Are they saying anything? Yeah, I heard someone say, hey, go in there, so there's obviously two of them. Hey! Tara, lock the door! There's, there's something going on there. Come here. Come here. We might have left. Okay, what's going on now? Hello? Okay. Didn't they left? They've left now? Yeah, so I'm just gonna look and see if anything's been taken. Someone opened the door and I heard them come in. So okay. I know that Did you know where they went at all? No, don't don't do that, Carol. It's the door still locked. It's not impossible. They, I, they must have a key or something. Because when I I took the dog out, I heard people talking. Um, and there was people last night, like sitting outside the window. And so they like were scoping us out or something. Nobody knows about. Oh, scary. About, like, the, the fake key? The, or the hide key? Yeah, but nobody knows about it. It's impossible. Well, I, I took it out. Like, I had it on my person. I swear to God, someone opened the door. And there's actually, like, people like No No, Rachel. Like, people seem to get out there all the time. Yeah, it's your thing. It's fake. It's fake. And then mm -hmm. left. Why is the door still locked? Well, <laughs> I can't explain that, but I heard like two people talking. Are is the office closed? What was that? Is the officer closed? I'm not sure where they're coming from. They're on the way. I don't know where they're coming from though. Hi. Uh, I, what do you want them? 
Do what in the bathroom? We have a clock in the bathroom, so it's six. Yeah, I don't know. Right. <laughs> if something gets in that room, you don't have to. Um, so, so, so. Uh, the I have to. Well, we'll try to make heads or tails of this 911 call right after this quick beer break. All right, cheers, me mateys. Cheers, Captain. Through the glass. <laughs> <laughs> so this call... That was made. This is from Kaylin's cell phone. And the call came in at 8.18 a.m. Mm-hmm. During this call, she is locked in her bedroom. So the people that she thinks that she thinks that are in her condo, they would be in the other room, in the front room, as she's explaining to the, the dispatcher. Right. But I, I would argue that she has her door open, her bedroom door open. I, I think what we have here. So this this call is quite confusing for many reasons. Okay. First of all, we have Kaylin on the phone. She's talking to the 911 dispatcher. And then at some point, she is yelling at the people that she thinks are in her condo, the intruder or intruders. Right. But then she also starts having a conversation with her roommate who was home during this whole event. Right. But she was in her room. Right. So I think what we have here is I don't know the layout of this condo other than the way that it's described or or hearing the way they talk about it in this call. But it sounds to me like you you would have at least a a, a main room, a front room that that goes right to the entrance. Okay. And then Kaylin's in her bedroom. Her roommate is in, I guessing, in her bedroom. Right. in In a separate bedroom that is next door to Kaylin's. And you hear them discussing a bathroom at some point or a restroom at some point. And so there, there's a, a third room, which is that the, uh, the restroom. So I'm guessing we don't have any visuals here. So I'm just guessing that at the beginning of the call, Kaylin might be locked in her room thinking that the intruders are in the front room. She's called nine one one. And then at some point when her roommate realizes what's going on, they're either talking through the door or Kaylin's door is opened at some point and they're, they're talking face to face. Yeah. And multiple times during the call, you can hear somebody other than Kaylin. It's not clear if that's the roommate be- behind her bedroom door mm-hmm. laughing or making a noise or saying something, or is it coming from the front room? Mm-hmm. Again, we don't have any visuals, but it, Sounds as if her roommate comes out of her room Mm -hmm. and then they start having a conversation. Well, if those noises weren't her, then obviously those are noises coming from somebody from the front room. Mm -hmm. Well, and to add to the confusion here, it sounds to me as if when she's talking to the roommate or yelling at the believed intruders, at times she might even be pulling her phone away from from her as she's doing so. Right. And our case is Kaylin Louder. Well, her roommate's name is Carol. So sometimes when they're interacting with each other, it's hard to decipher if someone's saying Kaylin or Carol. Yeah. We try to clean up this audio as much as we could, but the 911 dispatcher, he's clear, but on their end, they're a little muffled. Yeah. And he's having trouble understanding what's going either what's going on with the situation or the reception itself or both at one point when the roommate's coming out of her room you also hear a little bit more commotion so is it just the commotion from the roommate coming out of her room or is there commotion from the front room and the roommate because right after that commotion she says i think they left 
Yeah, my first impression of this call and Kaylin that we hear there is she sounds afraid to me. There, yeah. the, that's very clear and very obvious. So whatever is either going on or whatever she thinks is going on, she's afraid. And so I think we, we should point that part out. Now, there, there are some different interesting things within this call. One being, you know, she is communicating with who she believes has broken into her home, saying, telling the operator they're stealing shit from my house, yelling at the intruder, get the F out of my house. And then at some point you hear the roommate come in and say, look, there's, there's not an intruder. Mm -hmm. Kaylin tells the roommate, don't do that, Carol. I don't know what that means. I, I don't know if she's opening, attempting to open up a door at that point. Right, right. Um, but then Carol points out to Kaylin, the bolts are locked. It's impossible, meaning it's impossible that there was an intruder. Nobody's come in. To which Kaylin responds, they must have a key or something. Yeah, which is strange. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know the distance from that room where there's where they're at or did they move to the front room to see clearly because sometimes you can go into a room and at a glance you think that that the deadbolt is locked mm -hmm. and then once you get closer you go no nah, that's not locked right. so is, is it a, is it a mistake on the roommate's part mm -hmm. and then by having her having a mistake that people start going well we don't know if Kalen was of her right mind yeah yeah, and our friend John Lorden from uh, Brain Scratch. Yeah, has he, cool pins. That's right. He, uh, you know, when he listens to these calls, and I'm going from his show information, he gives his opinion, and he points out some interesting things. He says, look, if, if Kaylin is in her room and her roommate is home, mm -hmm. he says, I don't know why she doesn't assume that the noises she's hearing are either coming from the roommate, maybe the roommate's watching TV or an action film or listening to the radio, anything, you know, other than first jumping to the thought that there's an intruder. Right. But that's where to me, if you lived in any of these small apartments, if you're in your room and your door's locked, you'd have a hard time distinguishing what's coming from the main room or somebody else's bedroom. Mm -hmm. But if your bedroom doors open, then you're going, okay, I can clearly hear what's coming from her bedroom and whatever sounds I'm hearing in the front room are not the sounds that I'm hearing coming from my my roommate's room. Yeah, and I don't know the the layout of their condo with inside their condo, but I do know the layout of the condo complex. And I can say this: they are sharing walls with neighbors. So, right. and you know, and anybody that's lived in yeah. an apartment or a dorm or a condo, you know that you it's not tough to to hear your neighbors from time to time. Yeah, there's that Mitch Hedberg bit where he says he'd blast his music and his neighbor would always come knocking on his wall to tell him to turn down. Mm -hmm. And he'd always go up to the wall and go, go around. There's no door on my side. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing, too, is when she's yelling at the intruders, one thing that I found interesting, and I know we all behave differently in a, in a, a panic situation. Mm-hmm. But at no time does she say like, hey, I'm on the phone with the police or you better get out of here. I'm calling the cops, you know. Well, she does say get out of my house. That's true. That's true. But yeah, but you're right. She should be going. If if you would threaten, hey, I'm going to call the cops. I'm on the phone with the cops. Mm -hmm. uh, but and she she's said, not trying to be quiet about being on the phone with 911 either. No, it's not like she's whispering huddled in her closet or in a corner somewhere. I think she has her bedroom door open and I think she's looking down the hallway or whatever. And I, and I think it, what's strange to me is the shut up, mm -hmm. the shut up. It's like, are they laughing? You know, does well, there's a like laugh in there. Yeah. Let, let's play that. Clip. Play the laugh real quick. Can you still hear them? Yes. If you listen closely in between their talking, you'll kind of hear a ha 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 ha. Mm-hmm. Let's play it one more time. Can you still hear them? Yes. So that's clearly something, a laughter, mm -hmm. but it could be from a television. It could be coming from her roommate's room, or it could be coming from the front room. The The way I take this, my you know, just trying to make logic of it, 
I wonder if that's the roommate laughing like, oh, here we go again. You know, she's calling the police and there's clearly nobody here. Like, not laughing at Kaylin, but laughing at the situation because it's, you know, it's, you know. No, I understand that. But when we first started diving into this case and you start seeing stuff on Reddit that maybe something was going on with Kaylin mentally, I don't hear it in her voice. No. And I don't hear somebody that's not coherent. There's not one time that she's asked a question that she doesn't answer. Right. She's she's pretty clear with her answers. Now, the operator seems to have some trouble either understanding her or maybe this is some kind of smart way of clarifying. Right. You know, because he knows that he's sending officers into a situation and to which the call comes in, there's intruders in her home. She reports that they probably have weapons, they have guns, and that she feels that she, her life, or she's in some type of physical danger. Right, but again, he's going, okay, where's the entrance? Mm -hmm. You know, or how many entrances are there? Are there exit, you know, are there exit points? Yeah, and then he talks about, well, are there other people there? Well, yeah, the roommate, but at some point she goes, there's six apartments, Mm -hmm. meaning there's six units. Mm -hmm. And again, this is not her making a statement that's out of nowhere. So I I don't see. Well, in in regards to the entrance or other exits, she, this is very specific. She says there's only one and it's on the West side. Right. And, and now, and we got to go based off evidence. So it's just so strange to me that. We don't have the first two 911 calls. Right. Just so, reports of what were discussed during those. Is it very possible that there's some people messing with her? She's going outside. You know, some mm-hmm. teenagers maybe or young 20-some-year-olds that are messing with her. And they decided to open up the door and, and sit down on their her couch. And maybe the TV's on. Yeah, you know, is somebody is somebody messing with her? Because also, when she starts talking to the roommate, it's it's muffled, so we can't actually hear what the roommate's saying. But at the same time, she's going, "Well, it's impossible." And and then the roommate says, "Well, what about the other key? Like you know, like a key that was hidden outside or something?" There's, right. There's that point. So if the roommate, which nobody's saying, is having some mental break is trying to come up with some logical reasons, then maybe, you know, Kaylin is actually calling for a purpose. Well, we should point out that the police did arrive later at the condo and their report was that they found no evidence of a break-in. Well, let me play the clip again of where the roommate sounds like she's coming out of the room and you can hear Kaylin say, I think they just left or maybe they just left. Mm Mm-hmm. Door. There's, there's something going on there. Come here. Come here. Come here. We might have left. Okay, what's going on now? Hello? Okay. Didn't they left? They've left now? Yeah, so I'm just going to look and see if anything's been taken. All right, so to explain that the best way I can, there is some kind of noise, doors opening or closing. It definitely sounds like the roommate, but I can't be for sure that it's just the roommate and not the main door to their place. Right. And so she yells at some point. I think the door opening startled her. Maybe it's the roommate. Again, maybe it's a combination of both. But right after, she says, lock your door or something like that. And then at some point, as she's still talking to her roommate, she says, come here to the roommate. Mm -hmm. And then the roommate goes there. So again, if this person is acting out of their mind, quote unquote, then why would you be going into the room? Why would you be listening to her? And then... She's going, I think they left. 
I heard a noise. I think they're gone. Now I see my roommate. Mm -hmm. And then the cop says, hey, what's going on? And she goes, I think they left. Well, what are you doing now? I'm going to go check to see if they took anything. Now, I don't know about you, but if I called the cops, and that's that's how this conversation would go down. Right. Well, and and then I hear her say they might as well. So I think to that she might be being asked by the roommate if the if the cops do we still need the cops or are they still on their right. way? And I think she's responding, well, they might as well. You know, they're all because she knows, according to what she's been told by the dispatcher, that they're already en route. Right. And, and then the the call drops off after a, someone rings the doorbell. Right, which we could assume is the cops. Could be the cops, and, and so then the, the call ends there. Like, hey, guys, the cops are here. I do want to point this out. I don't think, from what I hear, that there was an intruder. And I also think that possibly... But that doesn't mean that somebody's going out of their mind. Because, no. Because if you have noises coming from the roommate, you have maybe some noises coming outside... Right from outside, mm-hmm. plus you have your apartment's connected to another apartment, so you have noises coming from there. Is it possible that she went to go out of her room, something kind of startled her, and then when she stopped to listen for a while, there was noises that she couldn't explain, mm-hmm. and then she called the cops. Hey, I think somebody's in my house, right? And then the cops come, and they say, there's nobody in the house. How many how many times do you think they get calls every month of, you know, I could hear a crash in my garage. This happened to me one night. Uh-huh. Hear, hear a crash in my garage. It's like 1130 at night, and, I, and there was kids going around the neighborhood, or maybe there weren't kids. At night, when there was garage doors open, they were going in and just grabbing whatever and taking off. Mm-hmm. And so I hear this crash in my garage and it's 1130 at night and I pause and think, should I call the cops? So my first thought, well, just let me open up the door. Right. So I open up the door, turn on the light. Well, guess what? The garage door was closed and something just fell over. But it wouldn't have been unreasonable if I would have called the cops. Right. And then they show up and they, and they, and they determined that nobody broke into my house. Oh, well. Well, like I was saying, I I don't think from what I can hear there, I would I wouldn't say that there were intruders into the condo. However, this thing in and, and the, these are other people's words that I've found online, people commenting and posting comments regarding this situation where people say, "Well, she's clearly crazy. She's clearly delusional, out of her mind." Right. I want to remind everybody that posts something like that this young woman is only out of her mind if there's no one there. We don't. We can't say for certain that, that there was no one there. From what I hear, it doesn't sound like there was anyone there. But what I don't like about this situation is at no point, at no time could I find the roommate who was clearly there commenting regarding this situation, clearing up what, what may or may not have been going on. Right. We, the family is very upfront, very up, you know, forward with leading the search and looking for their daughter and their sister. And they are in the press. They are commenting. They are doing interviews. And I understand that doesn't work for everybody. But somebody, the one person that, that is still available that could clear up what could have been going on on Friday night, as well as what could have been going on Saturday morning, I couldn't find any at any point that they ever gave a statement. Yeah, but no, everything you said there was great, but you have a family saying, we talked to her. She didn't seem like she was off her rocker, right? Right. That her mother, her mother spoke to her. So, so I'll take you through that scenario real quick. Yeah. Okay. So her mother, Kaylin's mother, Suzanne Louder says that she spoke to Kaylin on this same day that Kaylin sounded normal to her. 
And from what I found, Kaylin checked in often, almost daily with her family. And I think that was most of the time with her mother. So if anyone is going to be aware that something was wrong just by going by Kaylin's tone or Kaylin's voice, I'm very confident her mother would be able to decipher that just from a phone conversation. But to be clear, I don't have the time of that phone call from her mother to Kaylin. But her mother does state that it was the morning of the disappearance, which Which, that 911 call was the morning as well. Right. But do we have a comment from the mother saying, hey, I've listened to this 911 call and this that's my daughter and and it doesn't sound odd to me because it doesn't sound odd to me. Mm -hmm. You know, again, there might not be somebody in the apartment, but is that just a mistake that she made? I believe the the family's statement regarding this 911 call and the surveillance footage, which we will get to, is that that maybe some of it seems strange, but not all of it seems strange. And I think I think what comes up most of the time mm. in in the media was the surveillance footage. So they may simply be responding to that. The problem is their daughter is missing, and when she is missing. There's so many people in the public and it's saying they're not responding well to it. The citizens, the, pu- the public is not responding well to this missing woman because the public's perception by some were, oh, this person, this person lost it. She's delusional, delusional, and she either ran away or harmed herself. Right. So therefore, the, the, the alert level is not of great concern as far as the public goes. And when you're her family who need to find their daughter, all you have is the public's help. You're, you're crying out to the public, help us find our daughter. And and one thing that I love that they, they stood by and, and, and kept reiterating you hear in that clip that we played for the trailer, the news clip where the mother almost goes out of the way to say our college graduate daughter, Right. And I think the and then she goes on to describe her personality a little bit. I think that that was very smart on the family's behalf because I think at that time what's going on is they're saying, "You know what? We desperately need the help of the public to help find our daughter." Well, they probably and, read a lot of books, you know. And we need them to see her as a as a person, as as a real life living breathing human being with feelings. That's just as normal as everybody else out there. And I think that's their way of pushing past. Hey, it doesn't matter whatever you think is going on in these, on these 911 calls right. and on the surveillance footage, this person's still missing. Finding her is the goal, not so much figuring out what's going on. Right. So listening to this tape, I mean, your gut feeling is there's not somebody there. That's fine. I, I could I could agree with that on some level. I don't think there's any solid proof that we hear somebody else. I mean, there's the times that we even hear laughter. It's again, you could just say it was the roommate. That would make logical sense. But what's your gut feeling on her mind state at this point? Um, that's difficult. That's very difficult because, like I said, it's only this is only de- delusional if there was in fact no one there. And I, I don't think that there was someone there, but, but regarding her words and her answers to the dispatcher and how she responds to questions, Mm -hmm. she doesn't sound delusional to me. Yeah. And it's also difficult too, because obviously we didn't personally know her, so we don't know anything of her. Uh, we don't have like speeches of hers to go over to, to determine, how she was normally. So, but again, I'm going to go with the family. If they're saying we talk to her and we listen to this tape and we don't think that she sounds like she lost it. I'm going to go with their thought. Now on to the surveillance camera footage. This is from the parking lot of her condominium complex. This shows her leaving her condo. And this footage is from Saturday, September 27th. I have a report that states one video is from 3.30 p.m. and one video is from 5.45 p.m. Most reports stating that Kaylin is last seen on surveillance video around 7 p.m. So I just want to go into it 
like that because that's the information that is out there. There are six videos that were made public, and we found all six of them on KSL News on their website. And we'll put a link on our website, truecrimegarage.com, so you can follow that as we talk about it. So on video one, the the first video, I want to point out that the rain is not as heavy in this video, clearly not heavy rain. A lot of the news articles state that there was heavy rain that day, thunderstorms, torrential downpours. Mm. That's not what's going on in this first clip. Uh, the first video, I see little to actually no rain at all, possibly. Uh, Kalen is seen in jean shorts and a tank top with no shoes on. I do want to point out the red car that is on the left side of the screen. Just make a, a mental note of that car as we're going through these different videos. Now, on to video two. This one is the one of Kalen running. This is kind of the, the quote-unquote famous one, we'll say. A lot of online commenters, commenters say that she appears to be running from something in this video. However, I see more of a jog rather than a dead sprint. I actually think she appears to possibly be running toward something rather than away from something. Um, I believe that, that she is also kind of watching her step. Yeah. She, she appears to be watching her step as she runs. So more concerned about the possibility of stepping on something sharp rather than whatever people, posters, commenters say could be chasing her. And then two, she appears to be checking for oncoming, for oncoming traffic as she's running out into the parking lot. So again, not someone that is terrified of whatever she is running from. I believe, you know, here we have these actions that she's not actually running from anything regardless if we can see it or not. I don't believe she's running from something. There appears to be something in her left hand as she's running. It took me a few times of watching it to to see something, and maybe I'm just seeing something that's not there, but it appears to me that there's something in her hand. Now, this could be possibly a white cell phone. It could be keys. I don't know what it is, but that kind of goes back to my point of, I feel like she's running to something, you know, like, like you don't put on your shoes every time. If you're just going to run outside real quick and hand something off to the driver of a car, or if you're running next door to deliver something to, you know, a neighbor at some point. Yeah. Or maybe it has something to do with her dog, but we have this maroon car that's in the first video, not in the second video. And all of a sudden it shows up again magically in the third video. Mm -hmm. Well, in video three, this is the one where Kaylin is talking. Um, some say that she is talking to herself. And I believe police even stated that in their comments regarding this footage. Mm -hmm. that, look, sorry, but she's clearly talking to her dog, Phyllis. Phyllis is a small black pug. Yeah. And her dog is outside with her. Everyone that I know talks to their pets. And she's probably... Oh, the white... It's a white bag to pick up the poop. Well, at this point, it's clearly a white bag. But the reason why I suggested possibly other items for video two is only because we have a list of items that were said were left behind. And I can't clearly decipher that that's a bag in video two where you can in video three. And so what I think we have here is some people, they like to spin a nice yarn, right? And it's a better story if she's out in the parking lot talking to herself. But I'm right. sorry, people, that's not what's going on. She's talking to her dog, very likely trying to encourage her dog to go to the restroom because it's it's sprinkling outside. There's a light rain at this time. Yeah, what's the command that's normally make, right? <laughs> make. <laughs> well, make. I, 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 make. Make. It's, Possibly, yeah. yeah. But I do want to point out, as you pointed out, Captain, everybody note that the red car is back again on the left side of the screen. Right, and then in the fourth video, it's gone <laughs> again. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a white bag. There's a like, grocery bag that's on the right-hand side that is now there. So that bag is lying on the, the pavement. Right, but that's not the one she's holding. You can still see her holding a bag. Yeah, and I actually think if if you go back and 
look at video one, two, or maybe it would be two there. and three. I think it might already be there. Yeah, man, these they don't listen to our show. Don't litter, people. So video four. This video most point out that Kalen is looking around quite a bit, and some people, of course, their imagination starts to wander, and they go, well, she, she's probably looking around for something that, that either she thinks is there or that somebody's chasing her. But again, using logic here, I think what we have is a situation where she's now back outside with the dog. And she's probably put the dog down in the grassy area that's that's just behind her. Yeah. She's on the pavement. I think she's put the dog down. And with her looking around, it could be she's either looking for other animals, if any but neighbors are walking around, or looking around to make sure that her dog went to the restroom so they can go back in. Mm-hmm. At this point, it does appear to me that um, it's raining or I'm sorry, does not appear to me to be raining in this video. So a break in the rain, this would be a good opportunity to take the dog outside. And it, as you pointed out, captain, she is holding a small white plastic bag in her right hand at that time. So again, I think that any of her actions and movements in this video are in regards to her dog, Phyllis. Yeah. And what a, what a great name for a pug, right? Mm Mm-hmm. No, I agree with you. I think she is talking to the dog. And I think the dog was out there in the first video that we we just didn't see. And she possibly ran, not away from anything, because it looks like she had to, like, run to go get something almost. Like, oh, crap, I forgot a bag, right? Mm -hmm. Or I forgot whatever, right? And so she runs back, comes back. The dog's there. All right, make, make, do your business. And we see that maroon car but then the last footage we don't uh, the last video she's not in the video but we do see a red car that goes through okay well so but video five Uh uh-huh we need to get to first so this video number five is quite different and there is some confusion on regarding what is in this video but what i believe it's showing is kaylin's roommate not Kaylin. I believe we see Kaylin's roommate. She walks out of that same area that Kaylin had walked out of. Now right. note the blue car to the right of the roommate as she is walking out to the parking lot and then over to the garages. So what you can't see from, from this video is the layout of the condos. So you have the condos. Then you have that giant boulder rock looking thing. My, my understanding is that it was, it's basically a mound of dirt that they poured concrete over. Right. Okay. So Kaylin has brought her dog out to, to that area to, to make the, make the business. And then you have the parking lot area where you see the parked cars In some of the videos, you see a red car to the left. And then what the camera is attached to is the rooftop of a series of garages. And there's a whole bunch of them. And they're single car garages from my understanding. So you're getting it from the viewpoint of above that garage. So with the roommate in video five walking out, she's walked out of the condo and now she's walked past a blue car that's to her right. And she's looking, she seems to be paying attention to that blue car for some reason. Maybe it's of no importance at all. And then she walks over into one of the garages. Then on video six, this shows a red car driving slowly. Note that the car is driving slowly near the blue car once again that we referenced earlier. Again, this could be the driver paying close attention to the blue car. Then the car appears to be pulling into one of the garages. And note, this would be a garage that seems to be in a similar location, if not the exact same location, as to where I said the roommate appears to be walking into. Mm -hmm. So what I think, you know, because people, there's no sound. So some people have raised question, well, why, why even bother show us this? But I believe we're seeing the roommate walking out to their garage. And then you're seeing her return in her red car later. Yeah. Again, it's, it's hard to know without knowing the layout of the land too much, but we're going to put that link on our website and on our blog, please Give us your thoughts on these videos. They're very short Mm -hmm. video clips. 
And I have some notes regarding the footage as a whole when you, you know, you put them all together as one big movie, let's say. Now, I said to you, Captain, on the phone last week that I believe that these are cameras that once they detect motion or movement, that they then record what they see until they no longer detect motion. After watching the videos many times, I now think differently. I think that these are always recording and that we're just seeing snippets that at some point before they release the, this footage to the public, that they just cut it at different points for whatever reason. It could be just arbitrary. Who knows? Well, it could just be motion sensor too, because it seems like a lot of these videos, it, it's there's motion in there. Mm -hmm. Either the roommate walking or the car. So, yeah, I I just I think with my with my background, what I'm seeing here is is cameras that are recording all the time. Um, I also think that these cameras were probably not installed with the purpose of watching individuals coming and going from that walkway area, but the main purpose, sole purpose of protecting the cars in the parking lot and the garages that are there as well. Also, remember that blue car I pointed out? I wonder if this could be Kalen's car. The, the blue car is present and parked in that same spot every time we see Kalen. In fact, the blue car is there for all six videos. Mm -hmm. But I do want to point out, too, some, some things. We don't have timestamps, or at least the videos I watched didn't have them. So they don't. we don't know at what time each of these videos is made or taking place, or even the actual order of the videos, other than the assumption that they are in the order per the, the news station, KSL. Yeah. Um, but in these videos, again, I don't see any evidence of somebody losing their mind or not, um, coherent, like at all the actions that she makes, I can make logical assumptions of why she's making these actions. Well, and that's where I fault some of the news stations and some of the coverage regarding this disappearance is we have them saying she's. She's talking to herself. She appears to be interacting with someone that's not there. Mm -hmm. That's just that's just telling a tale. It's just spinning a yarn. It's making a good story out of a tragic story. For all of our old episodes, download the Stitcher app from episode one till now. They're all free. And also check us out on Stitcher Premium, we have a show called Off the Record, and this week we talk about the fourth part of the HBO docu-series covering Adnan Syed, so you want to check that out. That's right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us in the garage today. We will see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Don't litter.